greetings. I happen to be Rob Redden. I'm the minister for the Grover Beach Church of Christ on the beautiful central coast of California. <clears throat> I've been bringing these lessons through this media through for about four years now, and we'll continue doing this until I am not able or the interest uh, wanes so much that I feel that uh, uh, my time could be better used elsewhere. <clears throat> But I'm thankful that you have tuned in. We've been talking about giving an answer to everyone who asks us concerning the hope that lies within us. And 1 Peter 3.15 tells us that we must be prepared to give evidence for our beliefs and our hope. And so, last few weeks, we've been providing that evidence except for last Sunday, which was Father's Day. So we took a break, and now we're back on course. Uh, in the first lesson, we talked about the moral argument for God. Now, right or wrong is something that is absolute and something that is uh, beyond man, and therefore is something that we discover regardless of our background, regardless of our race, regardless of our um, wherever we are in this world, we still discover there is a right or wrong. Excuse me for shaking the camera. You know, in Psalm 19 and verse 1, <clears throat> David said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the expanse is declaring the work of his hands. In other words, God is vocal in the universe and we must have ears to hear and eyes to see the message that is written across the sky that basically says all the design points to me. You know, the Bible claims there was a beginning and we have evidence there was a beginning and the cause of that existence of all things must be accounted for and God is the only sound solution uh, to take. And today we will approach this subject using the Bible's defense for God, and that is the design of the universe. From the tiny cell to the myriad of galaxies in the universe, the same story is told. Everything has the signs of design. You could read volumes of this the rest of your life and probably not read them all. And we will only provide a few examples of design that points to a designer powerful enough to produce all the design in this universe. Yes, God was powerful enough to create and provide all that design. And this approach has often been qualified by saying that it does not give us much information about God who's designed everything. But the Bible disagrees, and we will address that in just a little bit. So, in the first place, where there is design, there is, by necessity, a designer. We have biblical uh, support for that as well. Hebrews 3 and verse 4. For every house is built by someone but God is the builder of everything. You know, my dad was a carpenter and I assisted him in building things and building a house. And you know, we must have a blueprint and you must follow it closely or you might end up with a disaster. Plum and square are words that come to mind building a house. Now, I enjoy building small projects. You first come up with an idea and a plan, and you sketch it out. Then you lay out the wood. You begin cutting the boards to size according to the plan. 
Then you start building it together. And so finally you have the project. And anyone that looks at it will say, well, you had a good design here. But obviously where there's a design, there is a designer. You can tell if something has design or not. But if you find a design, you have to have a designer. You know, the mysterious stones at Stonehenge in England were probably intended to be a place of worship for pagans during the Monolithic Age, 7,000 to 2,000 B.C., Neolithic Age. Similar designs of stones on a smaller scale have been found, one in Malta, an island near Italy. But the place of these stones and the shape and position of them indicate that they were designed. And therefore, humans put them there, and not aliens, put them there in the shape and position we find them now. We may not know who designed them. We don't know exactly the century they were done. But we know one thing. We have evidence of design, and therefore a designer. You know, when we look at the heavens, it declares the glory of God. It's a cosmos, not a chaos. All that we know is a perfect orchestra of order. The laws of nature extend as far as the telescopes can see. Recently, by the way, it was reported that Voyage 1, that's exploring space, lost communication with Earth. Actually, they didn't lose the communication. It's just that it wasn't able to, uh, NASA wasn't able to interpret it because it was scrambled. You see, in 1977, two spacecraft were sent into space to visit our solar system and get a closer view of the planets. They continued on through space. Voyager 1 stopped sending messages that could be interpreted, and so NASA began working to correct the problem. Now, this spacecraft is over 15 billion miles from Earth. You got that right. 15 billion miles. And it was still sending data, and it was receiving data from the Earth but it couldn't send back data that made any sense. Now it takes over 21 hours for messages to be sent from Earth to the spacecraft. And from the spacecraft, it took another 21 hours to come to the Earth. So the scientists worked hard discovering the problem and discovered that a single chip was responsible and they had to do a workaround, which was an amazing feat. But they solved the problem, and the Voyager is now back at work sending data back about the universe. Even 15 billion miles away, the laws of nature are still intact. The design of that spacecraft was designed by intelligence, and the human genius has tapped into the predictability of nature to accomplish some of the most amazing feats, even... 15 billion miles away. You know, the late Dr. James Kennedy states that 90% of astronomers believe in God. And that's considerably larger than biologists, as I found in a different source. Actually, that's higher than butchers, beggars, and candlestick makers. <laughs> now, in his book, God and the Astronomers, the late renowned astronomer, Dr. Robert Jastrow wrote, the scientist has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he's greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. In other words, they're discovering what believers have known all along. One of the most monumental books written back in the 90s 
was written by 60 notable scientists, including 24 Nobel Prize winners. Cosmos Bios Theos is the title, and it means universe, life, and God. The co-editor of the book was Yale uh, physicist and Nobel laureate, Professor Henry Margano. He concludes that there is only one convincing answer for the intricate laws of nature. What does this scientist say is the only answer that have been discovered in the universe? Evolution? No. The answer it gives is creation by an omnipotent and omniscient God, an all-powerful, all-knowing God. Let's look at some amazing examples of design that point to God. And let me tell you, there are so many that I had to be very selective to keep this within a, a time frame that uh, uh, could continue your interest. We'll talk about air conditioning. Now, we know that water, that valuable liquid, is essential to life and has never been found outside our planet. Of course, I'm aware of the ant viewpoint of the world. We are unable to view all the planets of other solar systems throughout the billions of galaxies out there. So it's presumptuous to say that water only exists on this planet. But we do know that water does not exist in our solar system according to the present data. Isn't it amazing that our planet is at the exact distance from the sun to support life? If we were any closer, like Venus, whose average temperature is 870 degrees Fahrenheit, or Mercury, 333 degrees Fahrenheit, we would burn up. And if we were any farther, we would freeze. Mars... Mars' average temperature is minus 80 degrees. This location of the Earth makes the existence of water possible. If it existed elsewhere in our solar system, it would be frozen or steam. Now, what is so amazing about water is that it can exist in three forms, liquid, vapor, or ice. Nature not only changes the state of H2O, but man has harnessed the power to do that as well. We have ice whenever we want it. We have steam as well when we need it. We can have freezers or refrigerators to cool our food and keep it longer from spoiling. Years ago, we had ice boxes. Ice was delivered to people's homes and was placed in the ice box to keep food longer. There are no longer ice boxes in people's homes because we do not use ice to keep things cool in our refrigerators. With the invention of refrigeration and air conditioning, we are now able to live comfortably and travel comfortably and preserve our food through freezing and cooling. So man has captured the natural process of transferring heat. This is as natural as perspiring on a hot day. Sweating is nature's way of cooling the body. Evaporating sweat takes the heat from the skin and cools the skin and the body. You may have noticed that even on warm days, gardeners may be wearing jackets. I asked one once, why do you wear jackets on a hot day? And he said, we wet the jackets and stay cool. So the wet garment begins to evaporate and draw heat away from the body. Again, air conditioning and refrigeration is a matter of transferring the heat from an undesirable place to another place. This is done by changing the state of a liquid from a liquid to a gas or vapor and changing the vapor back into a liquid and repeating that process over and over and over again, which removes heat from one place inside the refrigerator 
and removing it outside the refrigerator. Smart. Simple physics, not quite. But you get the idea. This is an amazing design of nature, and discovering it naturally, we began to replicate it and use it to our benefit through mechanical processes, using the same principle in nature. Who designed that? It's obvious to any thinking individual that that knowledge existed there, that ability to do that existed from day one, but we didn't have the technology and the equipment and the tools that we do now to, in order to emulate that natural process of cooling the body. Now, when we talk about water, since we're talking about it, let's look at an amazing trait that suggests divine design. Did you know that water is lighter when it freezes? Above 32-0, it's heavier than when it reaches 32-0. Isn't that amazing? You could look at a block of ice and you would expect that to be heavier than the same amount of water that was frozen to be that block of ice. Bismuth is the only element that does this. You've heard of ice fishing. The ice is only a few feet thick. And the fish flourish underneath that ice. They do not freeze. Submarines may navigate under the ice caps. If it were heavier than water, it would freeze life and there would be no life on this planet. Water would freeze from the bottom up, killing all life forms. The algae would be destroyed and a source of our oxygen would seize and mankind would die. Yet, that is in place to preserve life on this planet. Now, is this design or just luck of billions of years of changes? Come on, only a little child could be convinced of that. There is an evident design in the makeup of water and it being lighter when frozen than heavier as water. The benefits of this is no accident. We see design in this and life exists because of this fact. Can't we see an omnipotent and omniscient God in all this design? The all-powerful, all-knowing God? Well, let's move on. Let's look at the human eye for a moment. It's a marvelous organ of the human body. Dr. William Paley, in his book, Natural Theology, discussed the tears of the eyes. He writes, and I quote, in order to keep the eye moist and clean, which qualities are necessary for brightness and its use, a wash is constantly supplied by a secretion for its purpose. And the superfluous brine is conveyed to the nose through a perforation in the bone as large as a goose quill. Once the fluid entered the nose, it spreads itself upon the inside of the nostril and is evaporated by the current of warm air, which in the course of respiration is continually passing over it. It is easily perceived that the eye wants moisture. But could the eye generate the gland, which produces the tear, or bore the hole through a bone? End of quote. And an atheist and evolutionist is at a loss to tell you how the hole was bored through the bone and how the water pipe was laid to drain the tears away. I'm being a bit, a bit facetious, but you know exactly what I'm saying here, that it was designed that way. Now, what about DNA? What is DNA? Well, it's about a 24-letter word, a, uh, a word. 
and it's a molecule that contains the genetic code that is unique to every individual. And this code is like an instruction manual for the making of all the proteins that form our bodies and help us to thrive. The information coded in DNA in each molecule of every cell is hereditary, meaning that it passes from child, parent to child. And because of this inheritance, DNA also determines our traits, including how we are shaped and how similar we look to our parents. And these traits coded in DNA will always get passed on from generation to generation. Each cell in our body contains DNA and is a whole set of encyclopedias of information to produce who we are. One of the most notorious atheists of the world, the late Dr. Anthony Flew, changed his mind and became a theist, a believer in God because of the design of DNA. This philosopher wrote 30 volumes refuting the existence of God or attempting that. But along the way, he saw flaws in his works. In the multi-volume set, Encyclopedia of Philosophy, just to the left of me up here, Flew wrote numerous articles and his mantra was always this, the pursuit of valid arguments with true conclusions. After 50 years of teaching and debate, debating as an atheist, he began to examine DNA. I want to share his words. After 50 years of teaching and debating as an atheist, I think that DNA has done is that it is, has shown by the almost unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which are needed to produce life, that intelligence must have been involved in getting these extraordinarily diverse elements to work together. It's the enormous complexity of the number of elements and the enormous subtlety of the ways they work together. The meetings of these two parts at the right time is simply minute. It is all a matter of enormous complexity by which the results were achieved, which looked to me like the work of intelligence. Remember his mantra for his whole life, the pursuit of valid arguments with true conclusions. DNA is just like a language interpreted by the cells to perform certain tasks. These molecules are found in every cell of the body. And there are 37.2 trillion cells in the human body. That's the number of seconds in a million years. And yet every single cell carries that code, that language code, to send forth the messages of what is to be done to make up the human body, cell by cell. If this isn't evidence of design, what is? This is nothing short of divine intelligence who could envision something like this. Only divine omnipotence could create it. God is the only possible answer to the design we see in the universe. And we have only touched on a very few supporting items. But I do not want to overwhelm you with them but these few can be used to give an answer to those 
that ask us for the hope that lies within us. So finally, what does the Bible say about this? Romans 1, 18 through 22. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools." You see, the Bible is clear. God created all things, and his mark, his fingerprint, is seen for those who want to see it, evidence of his existence. It is so obvious that one has, have to have ulterior motives not to see it. God made it clear. God made it evident to mankind. And seldom ever do we find man who does not have some concept of God. His eternal power and divine nature is clearly seen through what has been made. We can draw conclusions about God by looking at all around us at what he has made. That means that the design of all things show that God deserves to be honored. Our logical conclusion must be that he must be honored and served, and he provided us the basic concept of right and wrong to help us. But because the fall, God gave us a revelation to guide us, without which we would distort right and wrong as it is being done today For though, by those who do not follow his moral code. They are without excuse. There is enough known through creation to convince one of God's existence and one's accountability. It must move to the next level and discover that God has revealed himself in his Son, and we have the record of this in the Bible. We are responsible to search, and if we do, God promises to help us find what we need in our journey to eternity. Will you not believe in God? Will you not believe in Jesus Christ, in his word, and search the scriptures for the guidance you need to enter into the joys of the Lord in eternity? If you believe in him, have you repented of your sins? That's not just saying I'm sorry or feel guilt. That must lead to the dying to sin. That means you must have a reformed life. That as you discover what you're doing is wrong, you give it up. And you try to pursue holiness. Have you confessed that Jesus is not only your Savior, but also your Lord? Have you, base, have you based upon that confession the act of baptism, immersed in water, so that your sins were forgiven? Have you done that? Or have you been misinformed that all you have to do is say a sinner's prayer, which is not found in the Bible, by the way? But here is what the Bible says. Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 22.16, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. As soon as you see design, you see a designer. And you see that God reaching out to you. And you realize that you're accountable because of your sins. And you search to know God. And you discover that when you see Jesus, you see God. As Jesus told the apostles in John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But how can we see Jesus unless we study his word? The gospel records. How can we know 
what he wants us to do unless we have a knowledge of the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. I trust that you believe in God. I trust that you recognize that you're a sinner. I trust that we are without excuse, and therefore we need God's mercy and grace. But we must find it through his revelation of the gospel, which reveals to us the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And to obey that form of doctrine, Romans 6 and verse 17, is to die to sin, be buried in water, just as Jesus was buried in a tomb, and then to be raised out of death, out of that water, to walk in newness of life as Jesus was rose to a new life. Have you done that? We're meeting on Sundays at 11 o'clock at 202 South 8th Street in Grover Beach, California. At 11 o'clock, we meet to worship God, and we do not end a service without offering the invitation for those of you that might want to be baptized if you have done the former things. Believe, repent, and confess. You're a candidate to be immersed in the Lord for the forgiveness of your sins. If you cannot be here, Google Church of Christ near you, and I'm sure you can find a Church of Christ nearby, and we would urge you to visit the Church of the New Testament this Lord's Day. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we see your handiwork, your creation everywhere. And we realize, dear God, that this testifies of your existence, that truly the heavens declare your glory. And all things that you have made show us the loving design created in the beginning for us humans. We pray, dear Lord, that the message will sink deep in our hearts, that everything speaks loudly, that you exist, and that you're the designer, and that you plan to design a new body for us when we're raised from the dead, a spiritual body for eternity to be with you forever in heaven. We pray that we will be faithful unto death, when you will give us the crown of life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to thank you for your kind attention. We urge you to invite your friends, your neighbors, your relatives to tune in and watch this broadcast from week to week. From week to week. And I hope you have a wonderful Lord's Day and that you'll be able to worship God together with fellow Christians. Now, God bless you and keep you is my prayer. Goodbye.